Hello. This is the next session in our outreach series. And this one has a title of Jesus Heals. It's widely accepted that Jesus performed at least 37 miracles in his time here on earth, with at least two thirds of these involving healing. And this doesn't even count where Jesus cast out evil spirits or raised people from the dead. Healing was definitely a huge part of Jesus' ministry. You might remember in this series, we did a session called Jesus Knows. And in this, we talked about healing and its link with faith. We said in this session, that you can have healing without faith. And we use the example of the healing at the pool at Bethesda. You'll remember that there was a man who had uh, been uh, disabled for many, many years. And you can see from this account that the man doesn't appear to have faith in Jesus. He doesn't even seem to know that Jesus could heal him. He's just put his faith in the water. So therefore we can see that even if someone does not actually believe that Jesus can heal him, the healing can still take place. However, we also considered some other instances where faith definitely does appear to be linked to healing. In Matthew 13, 58, it says he'd come to Nazareth, his hometown, uh, but the people there didn't accept him and took offense at what he was saying. And it says in verse 58, he didn't do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. Faith clearly does have a part to play in healing. Do you remember the healing of the centurion's servant? This happened only because of the astonishing faith of the centurion. In Matthew 8 verse 10, when it says, When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I haven't found anyone in Israel with such great faith. And there's also the man lowered through the roof. It was the man's friends who had the faith here. In Matthew 9 verse 2 it says, Some men brought to him a paralysed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Forgiving sin and healing do seem to go hand in hand with Jesus and we'll explore this a bit further later but the faith of the men definitely had a part to play too in this story we also said that Jesus is about healing not just the body but the whole person including he he healing the mind there's a very interesting account in Mark's gospel about the blind man who was healed at Bethsaida. In verse 22 it says, They came to Bethsaida and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he'd spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. I wondered why it was necessary to heal this man in two stages. We know Jesus could easily have done it all in one go. He'd done it before, after all. We're not told this man had faith, or was even asking to be healed. Perhaps healing him in this way was for the man's benefit. Perhaps Jesus was slowly and in small steps building his faith and building his belief. 
this shows us how Jesus relates to people, how he understands people, how he deals with us gently. I think Jesus is showing us here that healing is not just about the ailment or the body, bodily condition. It's bigger than that. We also said that it is the power of Jesus that heals and not the power of faith. We know that Jesus sent out his disciples to spread the gospel and to heal. And if we follow that through and accept that we are his disciples today, then why wouldn't we today be called through the power of Jesus to spread the gospel and to heal? Another important factor about healing is if we fully accept that it is God alone who heals and not us, then we're free from believing that healing rests on our faith, but it entirely rests on God's goodness. And we know that we can trust God's goodness. Certainly there are many accounts all over the world of Jesus healing people today. And we'll talk about one such account later. Sometimes Jesus healed simply because people asked him to. Perhaps we would see more people healed today if we asked more. So if we move on, in this session, perhaps we can develop and focus on why Jesus healed. I read quite a lot of um, uh, book chapters and articles in preparing for this session. And I read um, an article by um, somebody called Don Stewart, and he suggests there are a number of reasons why Jesus healed. He suggested Jesus healed to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies of the coming Messiah. In Matthew 12, it says, Aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. A large crowd followed him and he healed all who were ill. He warned them not to tell others about him. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. And the bit I think they're referring to in Isaiah is Isaiah 53. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. More of this idea that we are healed by Jesus' wounds later. But several times in the Gospels it's mentioned that healing in healing, Jesus is fulfilling prophecy about the Messiah, showing that he is the Messiah. Don Stewart also said that Jesus healed so that people could know their sins were forgiven. We've said there's a link between uh, healing and forgiveness of sins. And it's a very important aspect of why. In many places, the forgiving of sins seems to happen before the healing, almost as if the, th the sins need to be dealt with before the healing can take place. But not in every case. In Mark 2, it says, I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone and they praised God saying, we've never seen anything like this. I do wonder if these people were more amazed at the healing rather than the forgiveness of sins. I'm sure I'd have been the same if I was there. Both acts are truly remarkable, but perhaps one is a bit more visible. Jesus healed to display the works of God. In John 9, it says, As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. This happened so that the works of God 
might be displayed in him. Jesus sometimes healed publicly so that people would know he was God's son and so that God would be glorified. Jesus also said this when he was talking about what was going to happen to Lazarus, about the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. In John 11, it said, when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Jesus knew Lazarus would die, but he also knew it would not end in death. He knew he would raise Lazarus and he healed in this way to claim it for God's glory and to show that as God's son, he was displaying God's glory. The next verse in John 11 is really interesting and it leads to another reason entirely why Jesus heals. Jesus heals because of who he is. Verse 5 in John 11 says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Jesus in his very being loved people and he loves us. He wanted to make things better for us. He heals us because he loves us. Jack Deere, another writer who's written a lot about the Holy Spirit and about healing, said this, God did not heal to show that the apostles were trustworthy teachers of doctrine so that we could have confidence in the Bible and make the transition to a new way of worshipping God. The reason for healing did not lay in a historical transition, but in the eternal character of God. Jesus is all compassion. He has a servant heart. He treats us with loving care. Jack Deere says that in Hebrew, the word for compassion is derived from the word womb. God feels about his people the way a mother feels about her unborn baby. She has tender loggings for that baby and would die to protect her child. Another reason Jesus healed was so that people might believe in him. In John 4:48, Jesus says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you'll never believe. And in John 20, 30 to 31, it says Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Don Stewart says that's why many of the miracles Jesus performed are called signs. They were signposting people towards Jesus. Healing in this context was saying, this is Jesus, this is the Messiah you've been waiting for. And if you accept him, if you believe in him, you're going to have life like no other in his name. Don Stewart also makes the observation that Jesus didn't heal everyone. He wouldn't heal on demand. He refused to heal when the Pharisees asked him to in Matthew 12. And he didn't heal or perform a miracle when Herod wanted him to in Luke 23. At the pool of Bethesda, as we said, there were a large number of people there who, who were blind or lame or paralyzed. But it's recorded that Jesus only healed one of them. In Mark, we're told 
that in Capernaum Jesus had healed Simon's mother-in-law and many, but not all, sick and demon-possessed people. But after, just after this, in Mark 1, we're told that very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him and when they found him they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you or perhaps everyone is looking for you to come and heal them. Jesus replied, let's go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. Here again we're pushed towards the overarching why. Jesus came to save us. Healing can be part of that, but his whole purpose was to die for our sins so that we could be reunited or united with God. I said that I was going to talk to you about an account of a healing that took place recently. And it involves a man called Darren Carlson, who was a, a youth worker from the US. I'm just going to read you what he said. January the 12th, 2019 was just another day in pain. For nearly four years, my body had betrayed me. Unexplained headaches, numbness, a broken metabolism, the need for a two hour nap every afternoon, and worst of all, significant digestive problems that made it impossible for me to stand up for longer than 20 minutes. I was forced to alter local travel plans, stop preaching, stop coaching youth sports, and a whole lot more. I'd preached once in the previous 12 months and almost collapsed, yet here I was in Texas on a Saturday evening, visiting a small group at the church where I was going to preach the next day. During dinner, I shared how I'd been in bed all day and was not feeling well. I'd cut a meeting short that morning because I just couldn't take the pain. They decided to pray. Nothing fancy, no formula. I preached the next day and went home. A week later, I noticed something. I had no pain. I'd not missed a meeting. I hadn't pulled the car over to gather myself. I hadn't taken a nap. Had I changed my diet, my workout routine, my supplements? Was I experiencing less stress? No. God had healed me with almost no fanfare. Unlike so many Jesus healed who couldn't keep the news to themselves, I've been reluctant to share because I just haven't been sure. It's been over a year and a half now and I continue to feel healthy. Craig Keener, in his Defence of Miracles, spends a considerable amount of time reporting on healings from blindness, the lame walking and people being raised from the dead. I've seen many such miracles in the context of my missions work. None of them has come from healing ministries, but from church communities and gospel advancing work where God displays his power. I knew that no purpose of God could be thwarted. I knew Jesus had all authority. I knew he understood my pain. So why was I hesitating to talk about my own healing? A few reasons come to mind. Many Christians probably pray for healing more than for the salvation of loved ones who don't know Christ. Charlatans also steal money from God's people, claiming the ability to heal. In addition, while we certainly pray for healing, we are hesitant to acknowledge it when it happens, fearful of being like the false teachers we all know. But there are also two other more complicated reasons that warrant at least some caution as I celebrate this work of God. The first one is the healing was not from everything. Lazarus was raised, but he died again later. Same with Eutychus. 
there were others who were healed, but there is no indication that the healings were total. They were just a taste of things to come. My body has been restored and I have been able to work without interruption. But in the past year I've had the flu, been tired, had a bad reaction to food. In this life, all physical healing is temporary. We will all be buried and we will all be raised. I will get sick again, maybe even with the same illness that plagued me for years. Future glory is coming. It's better that my sins are forgiven than that my body is working. The second reason is that faithful friends have been sick in the meantime. Another reason I've felt so cautious is because some of my friends have suffered and even died over the past few years. Some struggle with constant pain and I don't know how to tell them I'm well and no longer share ongoing pain with them. Jesus has the authority to heal them and he hasn't done it. Many of them possess faith much stronger than mine. They had more people praying for them and yet sickness and pain persist. Why? I don't know. The mysteries behind suffering are often a stumbling block for those who refuse to believe. I understand the hope that is created when you believe escape can come by the strength of your own belief, but that's a shallow understanding of the complex and multifaceted ways in which God works. The Christian answer to the problem of suffering doesn't answer every question people have, but it's still a better answer than anything else. Jesus Christ experienced suffering in the flesh, is able to relate to us and took the burden of the wrath of God on himself. Because of his sacrifice, we have an inheritance laid up for us that is imperishable. These truths enable us to rejoice in temporary healing and be certain of a complete and total healing in store for those of us who are known by the Son of God. This account struck me as being very honest and very real and very relevant. John put together some references for each of these sessions and for this, um, this session he put references to the centurion servant and the man lowered through the roof, both of which we've mentioned. But he also put this reference, 1 Peter 2:24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For me this verse is the crux of what I believe God wanted me to share this morning. We hinted at it earlier. The ultimate why of Jesus' healing ministry lies in his death and resurrection. If Jesus hadn't died, we would not all, every one of us who chooses him, be healed of everything in this life in order to enter into new life and finally into heaven. We said earlier that Jesus healed when he intended to. He focused on that person. He knew that person. He gave them his full attention. He was interested in them. He looked into their hearts and he understood them. Everything about healing points towards Jesus' primary, ultimate goal. To die for us on the cross to save us so that we could enter the kingdom of God. Here and now and for eternity. We only need to believe who he was. We only need to acknowledge our sins, our pain, our inability to sort ourselves out if you like. We only need to accept his love and through that and in the power of the Holy Spirit, the love of God the Father. Then we will start to understand the purpose 
the desire, the perfection of eternity, where we'll be with God, with Jesus our Saviour forever. In summary, Jack Deere said a few statements about healing that are very much in the context of healing today. God heals to lead people to repentance and open doors for the gospel. God heals to teach us about himself and his kingdom. God heals to demonstrate the presence of his kingdom. And God heals for sovereign purposes known only to himself. And I repeat what you said earlier. None of these reasons are based on the historical circumstances of the first century. They are rooted in the character and eternal purposes of God. I'll leave you with this photo. Earlier in the week we went to Mount Grace Priory and this is the statue that's in the ruined chapel. It's of Mary who recognises here who her baby Jesus is. It acknowledges that he has come to save us and die on the cross. Mary appears to be offering Jesus back to God to fulfil all the promises God made. I've always said you can't talk about Christmas without talking about Easter. This statue for me brings the purpose of Christmas and its fulfilment in Easter together. It underlines for me the reason Jesus came and the reason Jesus heals. All of it is because he loves us with a complete, perfect and refining love. This side of heaven, I don't think I will ever fully grasp this. This image certainly makes me think and leads me to praise and thank my Heavenly Father for the gracious gift of his beloved Son, our Saviour. Amen.